welcome back, Skigglers. We're back for another episode, and I'm really happy to announce it. But first, Pascal, my co-host, how are you doing today? Uh, not bad, not bad. And you? Yeah, actually, I'm fine. I'm feeling really fine. Uh, really excited about this one. Uh, you guys will learn out, learn about it in a minute. Um, but Pascal, first, I have a question for you. Um, I know you're a bike nerd. I know you love bikes. Have you ever wanted to make your own bike with with, with your own hands? Of your own design? Um, as I always say, I'm long of ideas and short on skills. So this is something I've obviously been thinking about, but uh, I've never quite had the, the necessary tools, knowledge, and, and as I say, skills to, to actually put it into action. So I'm also looking forward to this one, and uh, I'm, I've got my notepad ready to, to learn and take notes. <laughs> well, you for sure are definitely someone who should be, because you, you have ex, uh, exhibited a lot of great ideas uh, in our conversations. But before we get to the guest, um, let me tell you a little story. And that is the story about Bryson coming to Switzerland and kind of what a little bit of what this mountain bike podcast is all about. So when I arrived in Zurich, um, basically I, I kind of uh, leaned on, on two things. And one was the, the local scene. So there was um, Greg and uh, the Bruma bike shop and his crew, which is awesome. We're doing weekly rides. The other thing was, as an Avid Pink bike user, uh, basically kind of use that as my connection, not only back to Vancouver, but also like within mountain within mountain biking in Switzerland. Now, because it's a you know an American or a Canadian site, it isn't really used so heavily in Europe, but it's picking up, and it had a dedicated base for sure. There are a lot of people who are using it, um, and yeah, basically, I just scanned the comment section like everyone else um and also yeah perused the forums so it was a start but it turns out doing the podcast with you pascal really blew that whole thing open um what it allowed us to do is it gave us the opportunity to descend much further into the valley of detail that is swiss mountain biking uh something i really had no clue before just starting this so so along the way one of the names i noticed reoccurring uh was with a little white cross beside it uh was the pb or pink bike handle sleeping awake and I, you know i see it from time to time over the years um mostly on you know just some some good well thought comments uh, on some on some products that uh, i took interest in on the homepage, and there's as well from the homemade bike forum on Pink Bike, which I perused, yeah, probably weekly or semi-regularly, just to kind of like see what people were doing. You know, there there's some really odd ideas there, but there's also some people who really got their shit together. And um, yeah, so basically, sleeping awake caught my attention. Um, I thought, uh, you know, he made some pretty good comments. Uh, it it uh, it was respectful. Um, and guess who we have on the podcast today? The person formerly known as Sleeping Awake, um, but now he's known as Reto. Reto, how are you doing today? Doing fantastic. Hey, Bryson. Hey, Pascal. <laughs> Welcome to the Skits and Giggles podcast. Thanks for having me, guys. Excited to be here. Our pleasure. So, Reto, one of the things that really um, brought my attention and really grabbed me uh, and made me want to propose this to Pascal to have you on is that you uh, are making your own bike. And, uh, yeah, I just want to dive into that because I've also made a bike, a steel hardtail. Um, but I, I took a frame building class. So it was, you know, kind of guided experience, but in the end I'm riding it still and I'm still tinkering with it and I love it. Um, but you're doing things a little differently. You are doing it basically of your own design of your own, um, how do you say, like you're going about it using the skill sets and the knowledge that you have already acquired, or maybe you're learning along the way. And you're just kind of like, okay, I'm going to do it like this. And apparently you're on your second version now already. Yeah, so it's definitely uh, learning on the way. And uh, that's also the reason why I'm on the, on the second version already. Uh, and never really got very far with the, the first one. Um, there were like a lot of issues, like a lot of small things um, that I wasn't 100% happy with. And, and kind of started over with the whole design and changed some minor details here and there. And then in the end, it ended up being a completely new design. 
um, but the the first version was never really materialized. So um, maybe I'm still uh, uh, full of shit and will never see a bike. So we'll we'll find out about it. But um, yeah, it's coming along. Uh, it's coming along great. Um, so it's uh, a carbon fiber um, built. It's going to be a carbon fiber built, and I'm making molds and uh, first molds like all the molds basically are are done now. So it's turning out all right. I'm I'm getting really hopeful. Yeah. But I mean, I think the obvious question when people start making their own bikes is uh, is always like, why? Is it because you just want to find out for yourself what it you know what it takes to make your own bike, or is it because you're not quite happy with the bikes that are available, or or what is it? I was always I grew up in a in a household. It was just normal to have like a really nice workshop in the garage and like fully equipped uh, with all the tools you can imagine. Um, my dad, he built a, an aircraft in our garage. And so I kind of grew up with that and aviation around me and, and my dad's uh, friends were like some legendary uh, uh, aviation aviators around um, from Switzerland as well. There's some good stories there as well. And it was just always normal to tinker and to do, um, stuff like that and then I got really into kite surfing and kite surfing is just the worst hobby to have in Switzerland uh, in terms of wind and, and weather it's just like awful but building kite surfboards is kind of easy and my brother and I we started just building making our own boards and they turned out fairly well and ended up making a lot of kite surfboards for us and for our friends and uh, every every uh, trip we had a new board to try and those worked out really well and then I got into ski touring or a free touring um, and built my own skis and that worked out okay as well the first pair was yeah not great but they were skiable and then you learn along the way you know what to do better with the next pair and that yeah then one thing led to to another wanted to do skiing in summertime and the equivalent to free touring is a little bit uh, enduro biking I would say you earn your turn you ride uphill but then you have some fun on the downhill I uh, really like that aspect of mountain biking we have some amazing terrain right in front of our doorstep here and really like mountain biking but then mountain biking like a full suspension bike is quite complex to make and I somehow decided to make a, a road bike frame. Made a road bike uh, because I like all kinds of bikes and that worked out great. I'm riding that for years now and um, everything worked out beautifully. And so that's just like the logical evolution to build a enduro bike now. But there's no good reason to do it. It's just like a money pit and, and it's going to be slightly worse than what you can buy on the market so well but it, you make it your own right so then that, that exactly yeah it's kind of fun that compensates for everything yeah so it's like the best feeling when you get to the top of a mountain on your own uh on your homemade skis um i don't know there's just like something to it and uh, they work fairly they work just fine too. you can you can make a lot of things in your garage uh when you really put a little bit of determination to it so yeah but to be clear you haven't finished the bike yet right no it's not finished yet um so it hasn't been ridden it has not been ridden no. okay so you might change your mind after you ride it oh absolutely yeah maybe when the head tube snaps off in the first corner then i might rethink the whole thing whoa, whoa, whoa. wait a second pascal what was that sound well, I usually use that sound if I want to say a few words about the socials and where you, can guys, where you guys can find more information about the Skits and Giggles podcast. We are currently most active on our Instagram, where you can skid right into our DMs and follow along at Skits and Giggles. And you can find our website with all the relevant links and info under the URL skitsandgiggles.com. Also, if you guys like what we're doing and want to know what's up, just give us a follow on Spotify. Hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts or wherever else you listen to great podcasts. Finally, 
sharing episodes you enjoy on your socials, or a heartfelt five-star rating on your favorite platform goes a long way in helping us reach more cool people like you. With all of that out of the way, let's get back to Reto. Talk to you later. No, what I meant is you might you might decide that your version is much better than something that you're writing in like a production model now. Well, <laughs> I think that would be slightly arrogant, but um, I, I don't know. There's What was uh, uh, the downhill biker's name that built his own frame uh, this season? Nico Molali. Um, Nico Molali. Yeah, exactly. I, I really love that. And he kind of showed that, it, it. well, he didn't have the best season, to be fair. Um, but I don't think it was necessarily due to the bike. It was uh, a lot more that it takes a lot more to win uh, or like do well on the downhill circus. And even just qualifying is an insane uh, feat. But yeah, so you can do a lot. And you don't have to do the whole development yourself. Just uh you look what's around and what the other ideas are are around and you learn from everybody around you so i think it's it's feasible to make something that will ride well um but we will see i mean i guess the the main benefit with uh starting with the the road bike <clears throat> is of course that you know you remove the whole dynamic problem of suspension you know, it's fixed geometry points. That's all okay and kind of understandable. Uh, but um, how long are we talking in terms of, uh, you know, project timeline? How long have you been working on these things to, until you actually had it ready and were, were confident enough with it to, to go ride? So I think the road bike took me like a year and a half to build or something. But I... Uh, that was all, I always have like a couple of projects that go on uh, simultaneously. And then I think I started uh, with the first version of my Enduro bike three years ago. Um, and then started over like a year into the project. Um, and one of the reasons I started over the first version, I wanted to make the... So I'm not sure how far, like how much we should go into details here, but... Um, Basically, what I'm building is like a, a positive mold um, or a plug, uh, which is the shape of the bike. And then I make a carbon fiber mold on this frame mock-up. And then you have like, you open that mold, it's a multi-part mold. And then you have like the negative shape. So it's basically a hollow um, um, structure that looks like uh, the final frame in the end. Then in that mold you're gonna make the final the final uh, bike so and uh, i thought i can get away with like 3d printed plugs um that i printed on my fdm printer here at home i kind of wasn't happy with the precision i got because with the full suspension frame the pivot locations are quite crucial and um in terms of like the suspension characteristics but also when you have the the shock alignment and things like that, uh, you're just gonna kill shocks, I think. Um, so everything was a little bit iffy, and then I decided I have to start over. Uh, made a few improvements to the design, I think, and decided that I need a the CNC uh, router, a little small milling machine. So I built that on the way. And then, yeah, everything everything takes time. Build a couple of skis and snowboards in between as well. So um, it's a a long time in the making. Yeah. But I hope I I want to finish it by next Easter, ideally, and then go test it in finale. That would be oh wow the goal. Oh, that's that's always good to 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 bring it to somewhere where it's like almost everything is smooth. There's no rocks, no nothing that can break a frame. Yeah, exactly. Perfectly fine. <laughs> but well, at least you know afterwards if it held, holds up or not. Exactly. We all we always handle that this way. When we go to a new place, you you just go down a, a black trail to figure out how hard the black trails are, and then you you go from there. You can adjust, but otherwise you, you just go into the deep end. I think that's that's the way that's to go. Approach. Oh yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, just to you know, to 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 give also a little bit of context to the motivation how good is the feeling 
after those whatever 18 months you've been tinkering with the frame take the road bike for example because you're still riding that today how good was that feeling once you put a leg over it and stamped on those pedals uh i mean that was that was amazing um but that was also um during the the height of the pandemic and the hospitals were kind of full and i wanted like I probably should have worn a, a full face helmet for the first ride, but that <laughs> felt like very, very wrong to ride around on a road bike with a full face helmet during the heights of the pandemic. So I kind of uh, didn't do that. Um, and you're kind of, it's, it's all right when you ride through town, but then you have to first descend and you hit like 60 kilometers an hour and you're like, I hope the frame, uh, I hope that the, uh, brake mount doesn't fall off or something like that it was yeah, well so far it held up so i guess it's yeah. it wasn't too bad after all <clears throat> and actually um bikes are not always like made to or like they're never made to aircraft standards so i got a nice fork for my road bike from a um, high-end manufacturer I'm not gonna name it um, but then I wanted to have it, the fork painted in the same uh, paint job as the as the rest of the frame. So I started sanding the paint off, and I found like um, huge uh, uh, voids underneath the paint that I just filled in with putty. And the fork is kind of the most important part of the bike, safety wise. So I was like, at one point, at some point, it made me feel better about my bike on the other hand it was like ah oh, this is kind of frustrating but yeah it's interesting i mean i just want to touch on a, on a couple of things that you already mentioned right so because that approach of using some element of 3d printing to to create the molds and, and then having somewhat a let's say a carbon fiber light production method right because you know Generally, if you think about large scale production, you think about you know whatever ha happens in Asia, so those big fixed molds CNC that are the big blocks of aluminum, and you know they're they're banging out frames. I don't know many tens, twenty, hundreds a day, and uh, and then there's this uh, scene developing, and there was just another bike recently launched by a custom builder. Um, uh, Argonaut, I don't know if you follow that brand, and they use a very similar approach to what you described. Yes, a bit more industrial, but they use 3D printed silicone as their positive mold and then use uh, a CNC'd um, negative mold around it and then use the expansion of the silicone to, to really press the carbon fiber into the, the negative. And uh, that seems to be much more flexible, And uh, uh, but on the other hand, uh, highly reproducible, which obviously allows them to do quick turnaround times and, and really cool stuff. Um, of course, the business person in me wants to know, have you thought about making more frames and, and, and what it would take to, to, to actually make it into a business? Is that a goal for you or is it just still a hobby and, and you keep on tinkering in your garage? That was that was never a goal. I just like to to tinker in the workshop and and make my own make my own bike and realize my my own ideas, not necessarily for anybody else. And as we already uh, talked about, like there's a lot more that goes into uh, selling a bike because I would not feel comfortable um, to put anybody else's health in danger. Uh, I feel like what I do, I can take. The responsibility. I don't think it's uh, gross negligence. What I what I do. Um, I don't think it's particularly dangerous. And I think um, I do my homework, and I don't want to want to kill myself either. But then, if you kind of want to have a different level of confidence, if you sell a bike, so that would mean probably fatigue testing. I don't really know what that would uh, uh, entail in terms of of cost, but that would probably be already a, uh, a no go. I never did any patent research. I uh, would probably infringe like uh, 15 different patents. <laughs> and it's okay because I don't sell it. It's not a commercial product, but I couldn't put it on the market like that. So there's a lot more that goes into it. <clears throat> and yeah, it's never uh, it was never the goal to commercialize it. Okay. Well, it's interesting because, you know, obviously 
what you do is not quite under the radar. So people, you know, follow you either on Pink Bike or on social media and they see your stuff and they're, you know, as I said before the show, I reached out to a friend of mine, told him that we are recording with you tonight, and he was like, Where can I send my money? And uh, when is he selling those bikes? So right, so there is I think there is a certainly with a lot of the big brands the the bikes start looking pretty generic the comment section calls it like a session uh, <laughs> and 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 people have a lot of appetite for for stuff that is either made differently or looks differently has a cool story and all that sort of stuff so so yeah i think that's uh that's really interesting well let's for a minute talk about why it's appealing because it's a in trend high pivot enduro bike which is like yeah, basically, I haven't ridden one. Have you guys ridden? I one haven't high, ridden high one pivot? either, actually. No. I currently ride a no pivot bike, and that's pretty sweet. <laughs> actually, you have the highest pivot because your pivot is at your head tube. Right. On. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, you know, they're getting the results. They're getting all the all the press. Um, in particular, your bike looks really nice. So. What have you been designing it with? Yeah, so it's a it's a high pivot in the road bike twenty nine er one hundred sixty four millimeters of uh, rear travel. Um, I ride mostly natural trail, and I like some rough rough uh, natural trails. That's always the terrain the terrain I um, uh, like to ride the most. And it was kind of uh, a bike specifically made for that i think just because it's my bike um yeah i used um two pieces of software really that was a linkage um and i bought a, a, a license for that which is a 2d um cat software basically uh where you can drag around all pivot locations and it will directly spit out um the suspension uh, characteristics, anti-squat, anti-rise, and and everything. Uh, so that makes iteration um, uh, a lot a lot quicker and a lot easier just to understand uh, how the pivot locations change the suspension characteristics. Because when I started with the the design, I had like absolutely no idea about suspension design on a bike, and that's another thing you just like learn as you go. And then you have a design, you come up with a design, you think that's amazing. How did nobody think of that? And you start modeling in a 3D uh, software and then you realize there's no way I can fit all the components I need uh, into around the bottom bracket. So then you, you go back to linkage and you, you start over with a, with a new design and then it's a back and forth between the two until you have something that, that works. And the, the 3D model of the, the final bike is um, all done in Fusion 360, which is a um, 3D uh, CAD software. And it's also a CAM software, which, I, what it, which is what I use um, to control my uh, CNC mill. Yeah, it spits out some impressive uh, graphics as well. Like you can render it quite well. It looks, I mean, it doesn't look real, but it looks like, I was like, wow, okay, it's like a presentation. The way you post it on the forums, the rendering uh, engine is is quite good um, because that's not a lot of effort at all, and I have no idea what I'm doing there. So, um, I think it looks quite presentable. But do you also have already machined uh, one of the linkages, right? Yeah, so I have done a lot. So I think there's eighty parts uh, that I designed around the frame. So in a full suspension frame, there are so many parts and so many little uh, bolts and axles that you need, and then a little dust cap to cover it, and and uh, there's like a gazillion little things. I can hear um, I can hear the cries out of the garage. Honey, I need a bigger bike. I can't fit all <laughs> the pivots and bolts. <laughs> yeah, and then even if it's like a, a small little washer, it's when you start machining and you have no idea what you're doing, then it takes you a Saturday afternoon just to make like four little washers out of uh, uh, plastic. And yeah, so um, it takes a lot of effort. Um, and the Rockolink, uh, that was one of the few parts that I ordered 
um, from an external company because my mill couldn't really handle such a big chunk of aluminum. Coming back to um, you know the carbon fiber, um, and you you know obviously have experience. I mean, we don't need to go into your professional uh, career, but you obviously have some experience with carbon fiber and uh, working with composites uh, through your work. And um, what I'm what I'm personally interested in is is kind of like the the materials you're you're working with. So are you just uh, buying like regular prepack on the market, or what are you working with? Yeah, so the mold is um, not made with prepreg. That's like dry carbon fiber fabric, uh, and then impregnated with a with a liquid resin. The frame itself is um, going to be made with a prepreg, so that's the same fabric, but it's already pre impregnated with like a um, an epoxy resin as well. A little bit different formulations, and that's all available on the market, and that's actually. Um, pretty cool because you could, there's there are companies where you can order all of that stuff in in small com in small quantities and it's not overly expensive and it's fairly accessible. That's actually one of the great things about composites, I think, because you can make very high um, high end parts or like ver mechanically sound parts in a garage without too much um, equipment. So with a vacuum pump and, and a little bit of creativity, you can make a, a lot of stuff. Have you made anything else from carbon? Yeah, I so not not just carbon. I use a lot of different um, fiber types uh, in my skis. With the bike, I'm not a, not 100% sure how it's going to turn out. Um, with the skis, I have a, a, a lot more experience because I do it for a lot longer. And with my background uh, at work, uh, we we work a lot in, in the ski industry. So I have some insights there as well. I think my skis, they, they hold up quite nicely. And there I usually use um, either carbon fiber or glass fiber that I combine with uh, some natural fibers. Um, and make some different fiber types and different... Um, orientations to to make some properties are you using any of those any of those insights from uh from skiing for the frame as well so i mean you mentioned of course mention it using different um fiber directions different fiber types uh, are you already using that uh for the bike frame or is that something that's like optimization on the fringes and that's for like version five when you've really solved all the bent bolts and all the other problems so for now, the layup of the frame, I I haven't uh, decided on that um, specifically yet. So I didn't make the playbook yet. Um, that's still to come. I think I'm not going to take any chances with the first frame. So it's probably going to be fairly uh, straightforward. And in a tubular like cross section, you basically need fibers along the tube in zero de zero degree direction for the stiffness in um, bending and compression traction. And then you need fibers at plus minus 45 degrees for torsional stiffness. And then whenever you have like a loading point or something, or if you have very thin sections, then you probably want to add some fibers at 90 degrees to avoid uh, crushing or have a, a more uniform properties in, in all directions. So it's fairly straightforward in that sense, but then you still need to figure out like how much material you need to use. And for that, I actually cut up an old frame I got my hands on and uh, burned off the epoxy resin. And then you can separate all the layers, the reverse engineering of the whole frame, um, have my own ideas in my head and like double checked everything. So I think by now I have a fairly good understanding of what I'm, of what I will be doing, but yeah, we'll, you know, make that up as, as we go Not quite there yet. <laughs> interesting just if i can uh, jump in again sorry you've uh, you mentioned so many cool notions the you mentioned reverse engineering the old carbon fiber frame of course one um topic which is uh, you know top of the agenda at the moment is uh, recycling carbon um have uh, have you thought about this and and have you thought about using recycled carbon to to actually make your frame um, how that be be fun? Um, so I, there, I would be a little bit limited, um, 
by what's available on the market. Um, and most of the recycled carbon fiber is also um, in the automotive industry. Basically, when they have cutoffs, they recycle it internally. And that stuff doesn't really go onto the market, I don't think. Okay. And I was just uh, listening to another podcast uh, a little while back. And uh, in the US, there appears to be a company that... Um that has the capacity to to recycle a pretty broad array of different um, yeah. composites and, and obviously chief amongst which carbon fiber. And I just like the 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 notion or the vision of a bike company um, when you can say you go rock up, take the example here in Zurich, right? You rock up at Cyber F1 and say with your truck and say like, hey guys, I'm going to take all your crashed carbon fiber stuff I'm going to recycle it and then I'm going to make bike frames out of it. Then you can sell real Formula One technology in your uh, in your in your homemade uh, bike frames. I mean that that sounds like a really cool uh, really cool proposition to me. Not quite sure if everyone agrees, but <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's probably a little more uh, complicated than that as it usually is. Um, from what I've seen, the the properties of recycled. Um, Carbon fibers is is quite a bit lower than the virgin stuff, and usually you also have uh, chopped fibers. So the fiber alignment is not. Um, so what they do is like mostly uh, forged carbon fabrics or like uh, random uh, orientation mats. So it's not quite as well con uh, controlled in that sense. Um, but nevertheless, I mean, there's probably some some areas in the bike where it could make sense um, to use uh, some of that stuff. But yeah, to be to be fair, uh, that whole thing doesn't make a whole lot of sense because in the mold alone, there's probably four, five kilograms of fibers only, and then uh, two and a half kilograms of resin. Um, so the mold is in the mold. There's quite a bit more carbon fiber than in the final bike. Um, and yeah, so the most ecological uh, thing would probably be just not build a bike or just ride your old aluminum bike. Um, but yeah, so what is that common sense you're talking? <laughs> <laughs> so, what are the next stages uh, that you will take um, on your self built frame? Um, yeah, so as I said, I am. Um, Currently building molds, or the molds are mostly finished. Um, need still uh, some some finishing there, and once I have that, I will actually start with the frame itself. And um, most of the the little parts are made. Um, so I have all the axles, the pivot axles. I have the rocker link. I have like all the hardware that's ready. I have. Um, a fork and a shock and uh, most of the components that go on on the bike. Um, there's nothing to it than to do it now. So, what has uh, what has been your your inspiration of bikes? Right. So obviously you're not designing this in a vacuum. Um, pun pun intended. You are, but uh, <laughs> um, but you know obviously you you have the bikes that you've ridden in the past. You have the bikes that uh, you really like be it visually or from writing characteristics or whatever it is. So, so what has been the, the driving, the driving design aesthetic for, for your bike? Well, I mean, in the end, it probably still looks like a session. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, so it, in terms of the design language, I think it's, it's really my, my, uh, uh, it really, it's really my, my design. Um, but, there is uh, a couple of bikes that are probably pretty similar. Um, the Norco range is probably pretty similar uh, from what it's supposed to do and uh, the suspension characteristics and everything. I think mine probably has a little bit higher anti-squat, um, but overall it's probably pretty similar. So I should probably just get that. You can always uh, rent one and, uh, and do back-to-back -back testing and then... Uh... You know, depending <laughs> depending on uh, on the outcome of your testing, you you know let the one behind you didn't like. Hopefully, it's Norco. Yeah, but but do I really want to know? That's the question. Probably not. Yeah. 
I so, guess another I guess another question you don't want to know is how much all of this stuff cost. How many bikes would you be able to buy with all the money you've spent on developing your own? I mean, that's a little bit. How do you want to count it? Do I um, count the rent for my workshop as well and the CNC that I built uh, specifically to make the bike as well? Um, so I think if you just count the the material cost and everything, it's probably comparable to what you would spend on a normal on a normal frame as well. Um, but then if you count everything around it, it's going to be a pretty expensive bike. How about components? Do you think about making any uh, like seats or handlebars, stem? So we, we will see how the project continues, but I would actually love to make my own like cranks and, and rims and maybe a fork at some point or things like that. So there's ideas for sure. But for now, I'm just like, Let's get the the bike dialed and um, yeah, start start there. But it would be really fun to make some cranks as well. That's kind of neat. I already have some. Uh, I already have some designed actually. Um, also designed some brake calipers. That would be fun as well. Three D printed uh, aluminum brake calipers. I think that would be a fairly neat project. And yeah, it would be fantastic to have a fully custom made bike, not just the frame, but everything. But I think that's going to take me a couple of years. So we'll see. It already took me a couple of years for the frame. So, mm. well, in terms of um, in terms of bike development, it's it's actually not such a long way away because you know the whole world is moving in this additive this or onshore manufacturing that and um we've seen in the past people like yourself tinkering in their garage come out with these like emerging technologies that get adopted by larger companies you know such as bike companies and uh they one sometimes they pick up these engineers uh and get them in-house or two they just adopt and pay for their technologies and adapt it to their uh to the bicycles and you know it's coming out of people's imagination it's coming out of their like just hey i want to see what happens when i do this and uh sometimes that kind of maybe it's out of the box thinking i don't know what you want to call it just creativity is what is needed to explore the boundaries of what we can start to create and ride so you also get a kudos yeah, uh, I mean, uh, this is a, a very good point because um, like the Pole uh, bikes that were just machined out of two halves, I think they were the first to do that. Um, and now Acto5 is also making a very beautiful frame like that. Uh, as a, With my background in uh, um, engineering, uh, this is just like, it sounds insane, but somehow it works. Um, they make a, they have a, a commercial product that you can buy for like a somewhat reasonable price. Um, and the same with the 3D printed titanium uh, with the carbon fiber tubes from Atherton or a robot bike as so it was in the days. Um, 3D printing titanium is still really expensive. So I'm not quite sure how they pull it off. So they have it fairly well optimized, I think. So um yeah there's some very exciting stuff um but yeah just to be i don't think i pushed the boundaries anywhere really with my design so um it's uh, uh probably a good a good attempt in a for a garage build but um, i don't think i'm gonna revolutionize any anything on the market with this bike right now so we'll see humble thoughts coming from uh coming from a garage tinkerer yeah all right. Um, before we wrap it up, I want to talk about two more things um, that we have on the on the on the notepad for tonight. One is um, hashtag toolbox wars, and the other one is the Red Bull Flugtage. What can you tell me about the latter? Let's start with the Red Bull Flugtage. So last year, uh, early in the year, I think I saw. I think on the Red Bull uh, Instagram page that the Red Bull Flugtag is uh, coming to Lausanne in Switzerland. 
and I have seen that in videos and just like knew instantly, oh, this is something where we have to participate. And I got a couple of uh, buddies at work and made a team and applied for a, for a spot. You have to apply, you can't just participate. And, and like we had a concept, we, you have to um, send in uh, a design and what you want to build and the whole story. Um, got all of that together and then sent that in. And it took quite a while until we got a, got a response, but then got a positive response back. So at that time we had like five weeks left, I think. No, can't remember. But it was not a lot of time to build a, uh, an airplane. And we knew we didn't just like want to go to jump off of the, the ramp. We just wanted to uh, see, as, uh, see as far, uh, how far we can, can push it. So internally we had the goal to break the Swiss, uh, Swiss record. Um, and the ramp is about six meters high, and the longest distance uh, that was uh, covered by flight in, uh, in Switzerland was fifty-five and a half meters, and that was what we wanted to be. We had like we started, and we were absolutely ignorant. We were like, "Yeah, how hard can it be?" And then we started thinking about how to actually do it, and realized it's actually really, really hard. <laughs> and a friend of ours, um, he is in aerospace engineering and uh, he was our external consultant. He helped us a lot with the design and made a 3D model and a lot of simulations of the flight path and everything and built a, build an aircraft and all the structural components were made of composite materials as well. Um, and we built an aircraft as big as we possibly were allowed to. Um, we were limited to 10 meters of wingspan. We were at 9 meters 99. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just uh, uh, wanted to, to cover the biggest distance we could. And it didn't exactly work out in the end, um, in the sense that we only covered 23 meters. Um, but it was enough to, to win on the day. Uh, that was really, really exciting. And um, yeah, uh, a stu stupid amount of work for like two seconds of flight. Um, and it's very exciting because you can't test anything really because everything is just made to be just as light as possible and no landing gear, no nothing. So you can't <laughs> just like throw it in the lake somewhere and just try again. So you're on the ramp and you have no idea what is going on and how it's going to work out. Um, but it somehow somehow did. Flugtag was absolutely fantastic event. There is also, um, yeah, it, it was it was so much fun. Um, a lot of stress, but it's it's really fun because there is also um, it's not just the distance you covered. It's the whole show as well. And um, one of my coworkers is into hip hop dancing, and we had our little chore choreography to uh, uh, dance on the on the ramp up there and it was absolutely hilarious made a pool out of ourselves but it was really good fun so i, I saw a picture from this event uh congratulations on your win did you end up keeping the helmet no the the helmet was uh, uh they just handed us um the helmet for for the the flight and then we had to give that back it was like hella uncomfortable as well so it was not necessarily a nice helmet anyway <laughs> Presumably, presumably, it gave you wings. Yeah, <laughs> no, it wasn't the wingspan at all. Yeah, it was the helmet. <laughs> all right. Well, you know, perusing your your socials and your your website, which you know, we put all that stuff in the in the show notes later on. Um, there's, you know, I mentioned it before. Hashtag uh, toolbox wars. Um, there are some stunning photos of an incredible toolbox. How long have you been working on that? I mean, how many projects do you actually have on the go? Um, right now I'm building the bike. I just finished the snowboard and I'm building skis for this season. And I think that's about it. Oh. Some furniture. That's fine. And a, and a full-time job in between. Yeah. But you always need a couple of projects in parallel because it's much more efficient because when you let glue dry for one project, you can work on the other ones. 
Did you actually take part in the toolbox wars, or did you just like a, a very nice toolbox? Um, no, I just so I so I, I discovered toolbox wars at some point on Instagram, and um, sometimes Pink Bike as well covers the the toolboxes from the pro mechanics, and I just like to re- wrench on my bike anyway, and it's always like a, it was always in the back of my head to to have a toolbox like that. And I had a toolbox with like nice tools in it, but everything was just loose in it and rattling around. And I was at some point getting annoyed enough to uh, do something about it. So I bought a, a Pelican case and some uh, um, uh, polyethylene foam, I think it's polyethylene, like one of these uh, insert foams. And uh, I figured out how many layers I would need to fill that uh, that pelican case and whatever rested in whatever is left in the bottom I designed some uh, some little boxes that I 3d printed so I have like small storage for like small bits uh, uh, <laughs> bits and bobs <laughs> so in the bottom you have uh, some 3d printed uh, boxes uh, for some um, storage of small things, brake pads and stuff, stuff like that. And then you have uh, four layers in total uh, with with the tools in there. Um, and I uh, milled that out on my uh, CNC router. That was quite the ordeal as well. Milling foam is surprisingly hard. Probably a huge mess, no? Yeah, yeah. Whatever I do is going to be a huge mess in the workshop. It's always a catastrophe. Um, but yeah, it doesn't it doesn't really want to cut well, at least if you don't know what you're doing. Um, but figured it out in the end, and now I have a, a, a fairly neat um, toolbox. It's it's very nice to work with. You always know uh, where is what, and and you always have um, you can see directly if all the tools are back in their place. And uh, yeah, it's fun. Very good. Well, kudos, kudos again, kudos for you know all the all the cool stuff you do, toolbox included. Really nice. I, I, I have a very nice toolbox, but I still don't have a bike stand, so that's a little bit ridiculous. Probably have yeah, to well, do something about uh, that. Yeah, well, you just learn learn how to weld, and then uh, and then you <laughs> weld together a proper proper bike stand. I, I yeah. see a I see a composite bike stand coming into your future. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, there you go. Now we can use some. Now we can use some recycled chop fiber carbon. Oh, to absolutely! To make like yeah. the lugs of the stand, and then you can just use virgin for tubes. Yeah, yeah. Three D printed titanium lugs. There you go. Yeah, yeah. nice and cheap. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but wait, Pascal. There's something pink bike listeners and pink bike people want to know from all over the world. What does the handle mean? Sleeping awake. I have very bad vision on one of my eyes. And I always have a little bit of a of a sleepy look in my face uh, due to that, I think. And then I, probably when I was 16 or something, P.O.D. came out with the the song uh, Sleeping Awake and that was on the Matrix uh, soundtrack. And that kind of resonated with me. Uh, I felt that uh, uh, that described me well and that somehow became my internet handle a long time ago. So it's because of P.O.D. song title. Oh, very nice. Well, it's a good one. Usually it's like, you know, this uh, first email address when you're 13 years old, which is, uh, in my case, trashhead at bluewind.ch or something like that. Um, but that's a much better story. Yeah. I Probably at the time, I didn't even uh, understand the, the lyrics of the song, the, the, the lyrics. So um, maybe I should listen to it again and, and see. Reconsider what your sing choices. About. Yeah. yeah, maybe. All right. Cool. Well, we're getting towards uh, the end of our time tonight, so uh, we would like to uh, close out with our uh, now uh, infamous uh, closer questions, if that's okay. Sure. We obviously have talked a lot about your homemade bike, but uh, we haven't talked about that first bike that got you really stoked about riding. Yeah, my first bike that really got me into riding, I still remember it vividly. That was a Yellowstone brand department store bike. Uh, hard tile, bright yellow frame and uh, red V-brakes, uh, probably all of uh, 80 millimeters of uh, suspension, RockShox fork, 
um, was the dream back at the day. So, um, yeah. Very nice. Very nice. Um, second one. Imagine you are Harry Skidini and you are a bike magician extraordinaire. You can make riding a bike more awesome for anyone by the stroke of a magic dropper post. What would you do? I was thinking a little bit about that. I think I have to say that everybody finds their outlet for their creativity. Um, for you guys, it's maybe the podcast. And for me, it's building the bike. But I think for a lot of people, it would be building trails, maybe. So that could result in some very new, very exciting new trails for everybody. Approved. And our last and most important question. So as the humble tinkerer you are, I need your humble opinion. What makes a great skid? A great skid? I really want to say it just needs to be a ridiculous uh, scandy flick where you enter a corner way too fast and, and uh, kick the tail out before. Um, but I think most importantly, it needs to be done on a, on a homemade bike. So. Homemade skids on homemade bikes. Love it. <laughs> what a what a way to wrap it up. Reto, thank you very much for your time. This was really interesting. Um, if our listeners have questions, they want to reach out to you, they want to find out more about what you're up to, um, where can they find you? So my website is retoabishu.ch and you have my contact information on there. And I, if you want to follow along with my projects, probably best would be Instagram. Well, we put all those things in the uh, show notes so people can find Fantastic. it right cool. there on the homepage. Again, Reto, really cool. Thank you for your time. And I hope to meet you in person soon and we can go for a ride on your homemade bike. Yeah, that'd be fantastic. Thank you, Pascal. Thank you, Bryson. Uh, it was a really fun time. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening. We really hope you enjoyed this episode. Pascal and I put a lot of heart and soul into this podcast, and it means a lot to us that you've listened to it. We'd also really appreciate if you shared it with the people that you know and care about. Until next time, Skigglers. Skigglers.